Institute's exhibition and symposium. It has been a joy and a privilege to get to know you. Today I'm going to talk about the work that I've been doing about the Hmong since 1990 and my own evolution in terms of getting beyond hierarchical conventions including first world, third world, primitive, advanced, pre-technological, technological, in order to understand Hmong and my own culture in more equitable and intelligible ways. The Hmong are migrant people who originally came from China and migrated to Southeast Asia in the 19th and early 20th century um, to countries including Laos, Vietnam, Myanmar, and Thailand. Over 20,000 Hmong were hired by the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States, to fight with the royalist regime and against the path of Lao during the Second Laotian War from 1960 to 1975. After the war ended in defeat for the CIA and the royalist regime, the Hmong returned to their villages to try to make a new life in Laos. However, once the path at Lao had fully taken over the government, they began to arrest and kill the Hmong who had fought against them. And so by 1978, hundreds of thousands of Hmong fled across the Mekong River in Thailand. In 1989, I went to a county fair in Northern California and found a five foot by 10 foot embroidery made by the Hmong in a refugee camp in Thailand. I learned that half a million Hmong and Cambodian refugees had been living in refugee camps in Thailand since the late 1970s. I was impressed that I knew nothing about them, especially since I had done massive research about US foreign military activity and never had read about those camps. <clears throat> Um, um, in the United States, the wars in Indochina had ended by 1975, and so we were unaware of the continuing effect of those wars on the people in Southeast Asia. In 1990, I decided to visit those refugee camps to better understand the aftermath of war and, the, and its effect on the people who survived. The images included here are a tiny fraction of the thousands of images in this project. <clears throat> um, um, uh, this is the embroidery that I purchased. I was very interested in the Hmong ability to communicate their history since um, 1800 using this map mapping form as a vehicle. The embroidery is very precise depiction of their lives and I was impressed by the economy of means they use to tell their history in such rich detail. People who know their history can identify the specific kinds of weapons used, food produced, and village structure. These embroideries were generated only in the refugee camps as a mechanism to tell their story to the outside world. This um, map conforms to the one we just saw, with the Mekong River following the northern border of Thailand and Laos. The Hmong refugee camps were generally near the northern um, edge of um, Thailand. In Thailand, I went to two Hmong camps, Bandanai refugee camp and Chang Kham detention camp, where I met Ku Chang, an 18-year-old refugee who had lived for 12 years in those camps. He had taught himself English, Thai, Lao, and written Hmong languages, and was assigned to be my guide because he was one of the, um, because he was one of the few English-speaking Hmong in the camps. We became friends, and when I returned home, he sent me his autobiography about his war experiences as a child in Laos, fleeing across the Mekong and living in the camps. I thought it was such an important document that I mocked it up into a better book format and sent it to a national book contest. In 1992, we won the contest and so were able to publish the book. I was impressed that Ku could remember details and history far better than I. The Hmong have no traditional written language and so must develop their ability to remember if they want to preserve their history and culture. I was struck by the effect of writing in the computer in technologically advanced um, countries that has relieved people of the necessity to remember. This was the first time that I experienced a carefully honed mind that had developed memory capability so fully and far better than my own. Ku and his family immigrated to the United States in 1992. Since then, I have remained in touch with Ku, 
Ma, his wife, and his family, visiting them in Fresno, California um, in 1992 and 95, and then visiting them in North Carolina in 99 after they moved there because they could not find work in California. I also visited Pu and Ma's family in Laos and Thailand in 2000 to try to better understand what happened to the family who did not immigrate, ultimately visiting 16 Hmong villages during this trip. And in 2004, I went to China and Vietnam to better understand the story of the Hmong in those countries. I began organizing the photographs into sections, Hmong refugee camps in Thailand, life in the United States, life in Laos, life in Thai villages. I juxtaposed the images from the camps with text in order to add a social or historic dimension not visible in the images. For instance, here I include the large metal roof windowless structure that housed Ku and his extended family as well as dozens of other families in the detention camps in the steamy tropics of northern Thailand. In the bottom right um, um, images, in the bottom right of the page are images of the bedroom in which the extended family slept. Images I had never seen because there was no light or windows in those bedrooms. It was only when I returned home and developed my photos that I saw what the room looked like. The text describes some of the experiences of the Hmong either in the camps or in the Laos um, before or after the war was over. I felt that the beauty of the color photos did not adequately convey the reality of their lives, and so I was trying to add a historic dimension to the work with words. In this house, which was the interior of the greenhouse in the prior image, families cooked with no ventilation using wood or charcoal. Needless to say, lung problems were quite common in these smoke-choked environments. Here is a small shop owner um, in traditional Hmong um, dress, similar to the way the Hmong dress in remote villages in Laos. Water was brought to the camps daily for 60,000 people because there wasn't enough well water. Sometimes the only way the Hmong could get enough water was to venture outside of the camps, risking being shot and women being raped in the process. This is a man um, going to market with his children. The Hmong were animists when they left China and relocated to Laos. Here the shaman has come to the home of a family to cure their young child. I could not relate to this spiritual and healing system, and so I continue to research the Hmong to better understand this belief system. For instance, here, when I realized that the darling, pig, darling piggy in the backyard was going to be sacrificed during the healing ceremony, my first thought was to pick it up and run out the door. However, I decided that that was probably not appropriate. So I thought that I could leave the house um, so that I wouldn't have to see that sacrifice. But then I realized I would miss an opportunity to experience the shamanic ritual, and so I stayed and photographed. Later, the piggy became part of the communal stew which the extended family and the shaman consumed. We in the West also practice animal sacrifice and purchase animal parts in grocery stores without the social or ceremonial um, dimension that the Hmong integrate um, into their uh, ritual into, uh, in which healing, spiritual experiences, and nutrition, and social cohesion become part of the ritual experience. For poor people who usually eat only rice and vegetables, this system is a very generative way to get protein on a regular basis and, and to share a meal with relatives. This is a young child who actually um, um, I saw in a Vietnamese Hmong village, but the amulets that he was wearing were very similar to the amulets that the, the, the kids in the Hmong villages were wearing in the refugee camps. <clears throat> when I represented life in the United States, I, I tried to integrate dialogue, a dialogue with history by constructing several different aspects of, of images and history and culture into one picture. So for instance, in this image, 
The large background picture is of a shamanic healing in the refugee camp in 1990. And the inset image is of Bao Chang and her family, Ku's cousins living in North Carolina. Bao was the only person I met from Ku's family who had a bachelor's degree from a college. Bao told me that she always went to Western doctors, but that once, when she had hives for a year, no Western doctor could help her. She visited her mother in California, who took her to see a shaman. The shaman told her that her soul had left her body, and that she needed to get a live chicken and bring it to her. Bao said, a live chicken is cheaper than a doctor, and brought her the chicken. The shaman did her ritual and Bao's hives disappeared. Here I learned about how a belief system might be strong enough to, um, to cure a physical condition which Western medicine could not remedy. This is Chua Chang, Ku's brother, with his car, Angel. Chua is both an animist and he also believes in Jesus Christ. He told me that after what he's been through, he needs all the help that he can get in this world. In this work, Sai Chang and his family are placed on top of a photo of the Mekong River. He told me the story of swimming across the Mekong River in the middle of the night and saving the lives of Pu, his three brothers, and his mother and father. When they got across the river to Thailand, robbers took all of their valuable possessions. Finally, they made it to the refugee camps in Thailand. He also told me that he was a satellite repair technician in the United States. I was interested that the monk could come to the United States and easily do highly skilled technical jobs. I remembered how the monk had survived for over a generation in war-torn jungle of Laos, how they had learned to fly airplanes and had used Western weapon systems, how in the camps they had made finely crafted jewelry and sturdy homes with few tools. The women embroidered highly detailed designs and each year made complex clothing for themselves and their families. Somewhere in these kinds of activities is the rigor that gave them the ability to successfully enter the U.S. workforce as highly skilled technicians. Sai ended his interview with me with the following question. Why did the United States leave the Hmong in Laos with no way to protect themselves? I did not know how to answer this question. The largest picture um, here was taken in a refugee camp in Thailand. The smaller picture was taken, uh, and the, the larger picture was taken in 1990. The smaller picture was taken um, of Ku and his family six years later in 1996 in North Carolina where they were attempting to replicate life in the United States. Here Ku is in front of his apartment in Fresno, California in 1992 in the martial arts costume that he designed and sewed in the refugee camp in Thailand. In the text, he talks about wanting to be an artist and write books about Hmong history and culture. The inset photo is of the automobile factory in North Carolina where he finally found work. This is Ma also working in North Carolina in an electronics assembly factory in 1998. Um, this is a photo, the larger photo is of a market in um, Chen Kong detention camp. The inset photo is of the Walmart where they um, shopped in Ripley, North Carolina. Here I juxtapose the market with the Walmart to uh, try to um, talk about the, the, the extremes of, of shopping opportunity um, that confronted them um, between the refugee camp and um, North Carolina in order to create a question about whether things had gotten better or worse for the Hmong um, since they left um, the, um, the refugee camps. In the larger image, children are pounding hard, um, hard husks off rice in Bandanai refugee camp. In the smaller image, um, Mao is purchasing 15-pound sacks of rice each month as a staple of their diet in the United States. The larger images of women sewing brightly colored cloth designs for sale in a refugee camp in Thailand. 
The smaller image is of the Hmong women in, in North Carolina who are working for a factory selling 144 sock toes an hour in their garages in North Carolina. Again, I try to juxtapose then and now in order to create a question about whether things have actually gotten better for the Hmong. I was fascinated to see the Hmong replicate their clan system and their belief system in diaspora since they have no written language, no head of state, no head of religion or religious text, and no distinctive architecture. But the combination of shamanism and the clan system functioned, at least for the immigrant generation, in allowing them to develop a vigorous extended family support system. There are 18 Hmong clans in the United States. Who considered all the Changs and North Carolina relatives? Here the Changs in his area have assembled to cook a ritual meal. They brought their pots, pans, propane gas, tables, and dozens of people to Pooh's house by 10 a.m. They prepared foods that they identified as traditional Hmong foods. However, Laotians identified them as traditional Lao dishes. The inset images show the men talking um, in the garage while the women cooked the food. After the ritual shamanic healing in the refugee camp, all the sacrificed animals were placed in the stew, cooked and immediately eaten at a communal meal where the animals became um, part of living systems. And that's the larger picture in this image. The Hmong in the U.S. in the smaller image replicated this um, system as well as they could, eventually eliminating ritual sacrifice and purchasing meat at local markets since animal sacrifice was forbidden in the United States. This is the head of all the Hmong clans in North Carolina and his wife. The background image is an aerial photo of bomb craters made during the Second Laotian War in the area around St. Juan, Laos, where the heaviest fighting took place. In his living room, the head of the Hmong clan displayed photos of the planes which he flew during the war. The larger image shows bomb casings that were displayed um, in small villages throughout Laos. During the Second Laotian War, the U.S. dropped more bombs on Laos than the U.S. and Great Britain dropped during all of World War II, and 30% of them did not explode. Today, the land is littered with unexploded ordnance, causing uh, present danger to people and animals and rendering a great deal of the potentially arable land unusable. Mad's advisory group from Great Britain went to Laos after the war was over and realizing um, the severity of the bomb threat and made these posters that they distributed um, around the country to teach the people about bomb threats throughout the country. A second poster. There's lots of them, actually. Hmm. I include this image to talk about the importance of the Hmong extended family system. Here, one extended family of three brothers and their mother purchased four bedroom homes for their family in California. Each family occupies one bedroom. That's the husband and wife and all of their children, and they have lots of kids. And the grandmother and some of the grandchildren live in the additional bedroom. All the people share the communal space of the living room, dining room, TV room, and kitchen. The grandmother grows fruits, vegetables, and herbs in the backyard, cares for the children during the day, and cooks dinner while all six adults work at entrance level service or factory jobs. My friend moved into one of those bedrooms with his new bride, who was pregnant. He soon was diagnosed with cancer. The rest of the family supported him and his family for 18 months until he regained his health and could work. This is an example of the power of the extended family system to allow people to endure difficult times. I could only reflect on my own vulnerability in my system that privileges the isolation of the single family way of life. In this image, the extended family has gathered to celebrate my visit with a ritual meal. However, instead of sacrificing a pig in my honor, they had gone to a supermarket and purchased spare ribs. The grandmother is holding the belt she has sewed for her New Year's outfit 
which includes numerous tightly wound spirals. I asked her whether it was more difficult to embroider spirals or to do electronics assembly work. She said the spirals were much more difficult. I came to view the spirals, the form with the greatest integrity in nature, as symbolic of the Hmong culture, which is able to replicate itself with so little seeming formal structure. This is the piece that's in the current show in Transition Russia 2008, in which I attempted to sh um, show the evolution of the Chang family from 1980 to, to 2005. Most of the initial images were taken by the Hmong themselves. This is Mao and her mother and siblings in Laos in 1980. Ku and his father and siblings in Bandunai refugee camp in 1981. Mao's grandfather in the refugee camps in 1983. Ku's father and two wives in 1988. Traditionally, the Hmong could have um, four wives but today, um, typically, they only have one. Ku and his fathers and brothers in ceremonial dress in the refugee camp in 1989. Ma is a young bride in 1990 in the refugee camp. Ma and Ku before their wedding in Chenkham detention camp in 1990. Ku and their family after the birth of their first child in Chenkham detention camp in 1990. Ku and their family leaving the refugee camp in 1991. Ku's father had to divorce his first wife in order to immigrate to the United States. This caused the, great, the family a great deal of pain, and they're uh, expressing their pain in this picture. Here is Ku in front of his apartment in Fresno, California. This is Ku and Ma and their three children in front of their home in Hickory, North Carolina in 1996. In 1996, Ku and his family moved to North Carolina because they could not find work in California. And then in, 19, uh, in 2000, they moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma to find work because, um, I'm sorry, in 2005, they were moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma to find work because there was no work in North Carolina. They purchased a house in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which they almost lost because of the banking crisis which is currently plaguing homeowners in the United States. Had I not stepped in to help them, they would have lost their home. I was struck by the dislocation which war had caused both Ku and Ma's father, neither of whom felt that their lives were satisfying or complete. Ku's father was living in isolation from his family and community in Fresno, California, unable to work and living on state aid. He was sad because he had no land with which to grow food so that he had, could be self-sufficient. I visited Ma's father in Laos in 2000. He sent a communication to his daughter that if she loved him, if she remembered how he had cared for her when she was a baby, she would send him $1,800 for a tractor so that he could plow his land. The irony was that Mao and Ku had sent him money to buy his land, and so he lived rent and mortgage free while she and Ku struggled each month in the United States. This is Ku's mother living alone in Fresno, California in 1999. This is Ma Liv working in an electronics assembly plant in North, of North Carolina in 1999. And this is Ku um, working in an automotive plant, plant in Oklahoma in 2005. I conclude my talk but, um, with this installation view of Hmong in transition in Cyprus 2006 in order to talk about why Helene, Giannis, and I wanted to continue doing this project. Here I place 63 portraits of Hmong from the refugee camps hovering above the floor like a river of humanity. On either side are video projections, one of Hmong who are still struggling in the jungles of Laos today, the other of contemporary Hmong wedding that replicates Western weddings. In both cases, the Hmong are vulnerable to extinction. The director of the museum was a very proper French woman who I never thought I would know. She came up to me and in an offhand way asked, so who are these people anyway? 
I explained that they were Hmong refugees who had fled from Laos and survived. Her body language immediately changed. She bent over and took a careful look at their faces. Then she stood up and turned to me with tears in her eyes and said, you don't know much about me, but I am from Paris. After 1975, when the war ended, many French organizations emerged to help the Laotian people. <coughs> Since then, I have been supporting two Laotian refugees who I have never met. No one knows better than I how important it is to reclaim this history. There we stood, I from Los Angeles, she from Paris, in Limassol, Cyprus, talking about the aftermath of the Laotian War. That moment remains indelibly fixed in my memory. We hope that the dialogue which we have here as a result of this show and symposium in Ekaterinburg will be generative for all of us as well.